So I'm Bethany Godso. I'm AVP for Career and Leadership Development here at NYU, and I'm very pleased uh, to welcome you this evening to what I think is going to be a very special event, Building a Sustainable Future, How to Bring Impact to Any Career. This event has been organized in partnership with the NYU Stern Center for Sustainable Business and the NYU Wasserman Center for Career Development with the support of a green grant made possible by the NYU Office of Sustainability. I want to start by thanking the Sustainability Office for their support and appreciating all the hard work uh, everyone on the Stern and Wasserman teams put in to make this evening a success. I also want to thank in advance our panelists uh, and all the outstanding leaders who volunteered to be here to lead this discussion with our students tonight. Finally, I want to thank all of those whose less visible work made this evening possible. Those who set the room, made the delicious food, prepared the AV, and probably did numerous other things that we aren't even aware of uh, that made it possible for us to come together tonight. The purpose of this event is to illuminate the importance of bringing sustainability into any career you may choose to pursue. This is really an important purpose and very much a part of our mission at the Wasserman Center to help you explore, prepare, and connect with opportunities that enable you to build a career that is both rewarding for you and has a positive impact for the broader world. Here's how the evening will proceed. In a moment, I will introduce Provost Catherine Fleming, who will kick off this evening's discussion. Then, our good colleague, Tansi Whalen, director of the Stern Center for Sustainable Business, will facilitate our panel of industry leaders. You will then have the opportunity to engage in two roundtable discussions with professionals from a variety of industries who are finding creative ways to advance sustainability in their own fields and we'll close the evening with some networking. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce Provost Catherine Fleming. I'm just so appreciative uh, that she has uh, made time to be here with us this evening. She is really a leader um, in sustainability here at NYU. I have heard her speak on this topic um, and know that she speaks about it with deep personal commitment. Um, so I'm very appreciative that she's here this evening. Catherine E. Fleming is provost of New York University, where she is also the Alexander S. Onassis Professor of Hellenic Culture and Civilization in the Department of History. She also served for many years as the associate director and then director of NYU's Remark Institute. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our wonderful provost. Thank you very much, Bethany, for that. Uh, so it is, it's a topic that I also speak about with a certain degree of embarrassment and anger uh, because it is my generation that, and, and not only mine, generations before mine, that are responsible for the fact that students today have to be sitting around talking about a sustainable future what we're really talking about or have to be talking about is sustainability now, a sustainable present, because without that, there's not going to be a future at all, sustainable or otherwise. So on behalf of my generation and my parents' generation, I'm really, really sorry that you have to be here um, today. So uh, thanks for the nice introduction, and thanks very much to everyone at NYU Wasserman and also the Stern Center for Sustainable Business. This is an important event. The more events of this sort we can have, the better. I want to begin by acknowledging the various business and industry leaders who are here with us this evening. I um, am intuiting who they are because they're the people who are guilty, as I am uh, in my generation. I can spot them by their age. Uh, it's inspiring to see such diversity of field among them and among you spanning technology, media, finance, government, and healthcare. Your participation is truly proof that many prominent companies and organizations are setting goals for sustainability. 
And I think you can tell by the turnout that our students are desperately interested in what you have to say. And as you know, there's a lot of conversation, some of it cynical, about whether or not the engagement of industry in this topic is something that is being done out of genuine commitment or for PR purposes, and I don't think we should care. I think as long as people are, are engaging in this, whatever the reason, that is a major thing. I also know that those who are here tonight are engaging in it in a very sincere way indeed. When I became provost, sustainability was really a top priority for me, and it's a priority that I share with our president, Andrew Hamilton. It was striking that in his very inauguration speech, he made a point of vowing that NYU was going to become one of the greenest urban campuses in the nation. So far, we are making progress toward that goal. In, 1970, in 1917, in 2017, NYU, it was doing really well back in 1917. In 2017, it met its 10-year commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 30% five years ahead of schedule. We're now on our way to 50% by 2025, and we hope to carbon neutrality by 2040. To achieve this, we're coordinating our efforts across campus with people in energy engineering operations, construction management, procurement. That isn't what it sounds like. It's when we buy things, campus services, and groundskeeping, among many other areas. But really, the road to sustainability, perhaps most profoundly, runs through the classroom. To date, we offer over 900 related courses and 16 academic programs at the university, as well as initiatives like eco reps and the green grants, which are supporting this event tonight. In September of 2017, we created a sustainability working group made up of students, faculty, and administrators from across the global network, and they're charged with trying to think up meaningful, achievable sustain sustainability initiatives that NYU could implement immediately. You can come over to my office and see some of them. Based on the group's recommendations, we plan to remove single-use water bottles from operations. Who has a single-use water bottle on their person at this event right now? Please leave the room. Um, we're reducing waste from coffee, and we're supporting new employees in sustainability practices during onboarding. And I don't need to tell you how much stuff each of us consumes in the course of a day. If I think of what my trash can looks like at the end of the day, how many things I've printed out, how many uh, pieces of cutlery I've used, how many plates I've used, and that is a tiny, tiny, tiny amount compared to what industry is producing. We've also worked to increase NYU's social impact. Our College of Dentistry, for example, serves 50,000 patients with limited or no access to high quality dental care. If any of you is in need of dental care, turn to NYU's clinic. It's incredible, the service that it provides. NYU's Alternative Breaks program has completed more than 140,000 hours of community support in over 50 communities in the United States and in 25 countries worldwide. And since 2015, Stern School of Business undergraduates have helped over 800 New York City residents prepare their taxes through the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. And this spirit of social commitment extends through our research and teaching across disciplines and geographies. It's something for which NYU should become increasingly known. Many of us worry about the negative impact that NYU or any institution of its size might have on its neighborhood or on its city. But if you calculate the positive social impact that this institution has, it's awesome. And I have gotten a chance in this job to recognize it. We're trying to help our students better understand the roles that they can play in making the world more sustainable and socially responsible, even if we screwed it up ahead of you. If you're a young professional or you're just beginning your studies, 
you're a graduating degree candidate or you're anywhere in between, we very much hope that you're going to leave tonight feeling a bit more inspired, energized, and ready to take on the job of making a positive impact in the world. Thank you all very much for attending this event. Learning is always the most important step toward making a change. And tonight, I hope, is moving us at least a small step closer to a more sustainable future for everyone. Thank you, and enjoy the evening. So thank you so much, Provost Fleming, for, uh, for being here, and Bethany as well, for all your help and leadership. Um, really thrilled to be here tonight. I am Tansi Whalen. I'm the director of the NYU Stern Center for Sustainable Business. And can I ask our panelists to come step up and uh, join us up here on the podium? I think our, yes, just go. Welcome. <laughs> I'll sit here, so do I want to ask? So first of all, I just want to sort of few, a few words of scene setting. So what is sustainability when we say that? What is a sustainable future? Why do we care about it? And how do we see sustainability in all the diversity of organizations and companies we have here? It's because sustainability means taking care of the earth in a way uh, that future generations will continue to be able to enjoy it and live on it in the same ways we do. It also means that we're thinking about people, we're thinking about planet, and we're thinking as well about profit. So we, we uh, need to figure out how to balance those things. So when you think of sustainability, often people think, well, that means recycling or energy efficiency. And yes, it does. But it also means diversity and inclusion. It also means anti-corruption. It also means transparency and authenticity. So thinking about sustainability, um, we see uh, you know, the Peace Corps working towards sustainable future in the, world, in the countries that they're working in. Or we see uh, PwC leading an initiative around um, uh, CEO uh, initiative around diversity and inclusion. Um, or we see um, uh, Eileen Fisher working on sustainable fashion and reducing their environmental footprint. All of those things mean sustainability. Uh, and mean that we can have an impact on our, on our present, as the provost said, um, as well as on our future. And when the really exciting thing is, is that um, this is happening, right? We now have 85% um, of the S&P 500 companies have sustainability reports. One in every $5 in this country is now invested with using some form of environmental, social, or governance filter. Right? That's doubled from... You know, uh, up significantly from two years before. We have, I think, a moment where in the same way that technology has become embedded in every job description, uh, in every person's way of being, sustainability is going to be there for unfortunate reasons, as we heard from the provost in many cases, but also because sustainability can drive growth and opportunity and innovation. Um, you know, just to to give you one small example, and then I'm going to um, start with our, our, our uh, great panel here. But um, we can solve for many sustainability issues using things that we never think about in that way. So some of my class who are here will know this example. I'm sorry, but I just love it. So think about a tire. Goodyear has designed a tire that's made out of 3D printed, so on demand, out of recycled rubber that's um, not inflatable, so it's hard, so it lasts longer. In the hubcap of the tire is embedded moss. That moss, when it rains, um, sticks to the road, so it makes the tire safer. In addition, the moss takes in uh, carbon dioxide and emits oxygen, so it's cleaning the air. And the AI feature in the hub controls the amount of water in the moss and allows the tire to talk to the autonomous vehicle that one day will be in its future. Whoa, right? <laughs> so how can we all put our ingenuity uh, to use no matter what career we have, whether we're in finance or accounting or NGO management or marketing, 
uh, and uh, whether we're in government or not, or civil society, academia, or business, there is a place for all of us uh, in terms of solving these challenges and creating opportunity together. So really thrilled to, uh, to have the group here. And we're going to turn over to some questions here. So. Yeah. So um, I'd just like to uh, introduce to everyone who, who we have um, here on the panel. So Dennis Williams is directly to my left. He's Senior Vice President for Corporate Affairs and CSR at HBO. And then we have Lee O'Dwyer, who's Global ESG Sales Lead at Bloomberg. And Amy Hall, who is VP for Social Consciousness at Eileen Fisher. And Jeff Sene, who is uh, Responsible Business Leadership Strategy and Implementation Leader can you say that all fast <laughs> at PwC? So uh, really terrific to have you here. And later we're going to introduce all the um, terrific leaders that we have at your tables as well. So to kick this off, if I could ask you each to describe your current role and work that you're doing and how sustainability in this broad definition of it is um, relevant to your work, personally, but to your company and to your industry as well. You know, what do you see happening there? So if I could kick it off with you, and welcome. I just got here. I um, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> your punishment. <laughs> exactly. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for uh, having me, and, and thank you all for, for putting together this really important conversation. Uh, again, my name is Dennis Williams. I'm the Senior Vice President of Corporate Social Responsibility and Corporate Affairs at HBO, where I've worked for the last 21 years, basically started as an intern 21 years ago which seems like uh, yesterday in some ways. But um, I've held a number of different positions and in 2010 was asked to come and create our Corporate Social Responsibility Initiative, uh, having previously worked in a multicultural marketing uh, function. Um, so to answer the question, I think, uh, I hope I'm not too much of an outlier here because obviously I'm the content guy. Um, and I used to say this to people all the time, when they would ask us to sort of measure our carbon footprint or you know, figure out the impact that we were having on the, on the ecosystem, um, I would say we don't make batteries, we make Game of Thrones. Um, <laughs> and not to say that there isn't room for, uh, for waste uh, there, which we can talk about in a second, but um, we're a bit different, right, in that we, we actually are not making uh, a, a tangible product that is created in factories. There's no supply chain for us. Um, it's a very different kind of business model. That said, um, the ways in which we define sustainability, um, exactly what you said, right? It's, it's so much more than just whether or not we're impacting uh, the environment, but really how we exist on this planet. Uh, and for us, a lot of that work is done around the inclusion space. Um, so making sure that the content that we put on our platform has the kinds of messages that inspires and encourages people to live re as responsible citizens on our planet. So, one, we can talk a bit more about that. And then the second uh, way that we do it is, you know, again, not making batteries, and yet on the production side, um, they're, they're, if you've ever been on, the, on a set, um, one of the first things that you'll notice is that's tremendous, tremendous waste. Uh, there's catering, there are trucks idling in your neighborhood, they're sending out carbon, uh, there are any number of scripts being printed day in and day out, revisions, um, and so, what we've decided that is that even though our footprint isn't large, we all have a role to play. And so in every little way, we have to make sure. We recently launched a green production initiative. We used to um, encourage our productions uh, to be eco-friendly. Now we mandate it. Uh, I think um, it was said earlier, there really isn't a description in CSR that I've seen in the last year that doesn't include some aspect of sustainability. Um, that is the direction that our society is moving in, that's certainly the direction that the entertainment industry is moving in. And so if you hope to work in this industry one day, in entertainment and media, uh, then this will be a very important conversation for you tonight. Thank you so much. Lee. Again, yes, thank you also for the invite. It's really a pleasure to be here. Dennis, I think given the fact that winter is coming, you may be the most important panelist here. here today. <laughs> Sunday. Um, so yeah, my name is Lee O'Dwyer. I work for Bloomberg and I'll get to what I do in a moment, but I'm gonna start in the middle and work outwards slightly. So Mike Bloomberg, who is obviously the founder of our company, is something sustainability is obviously very um, a big part of his life, something he's very passionate about. And around uh, 15 years ago, we started an initiative with inside the organization 
to do exactly what Dennis was describing. Think about how we operate as an organization, what our carbon footprint is, how we deal with diversity and inclusion within the organization, how that's represented at the various levels. And as we were doing that project, we realized that the data that we were creating was incredibly important and powerful. And if anybody knows Bloomberg, we are at our heart a data company. So what we started working on was gathering all of that data as it's being reported from various organizations, encouraging the transparency, allowing people, investors, portfolio managers, asset owners to apply our analytics on top of that data and start to inform investment decisions around it. So that's how kind of sustainability came into our industry and, and something that Bloomberg does um, obviously and, and pays a lot of attention to. What I do, I lead the global sales initiative that is putting that information in front of our clients and, and I feel I'm in somewhat the enviable position because my clients are corporations, they're asset owners, like uh, university endowments and pension funds, um, their investment managers. So I'm working with all of those people as they think about this disclosure, how they're gonna incorporate those decisions. And I think to the, the point that was made in the opening remarks, um, and, and Dennis just reiterated there, sustainability, it, it gets mislabeled as this green thing. It's about the sustainability of a company and you all wanna work for a company that is sustainable, as in viable. So the, I think the work we're doing to encourage that disclosure and the work I'm able to do in terms of helping people think about how they disclose what the best practices are really informs this decision and uh, it's a very exciting place to be in. Thank you, Amy. Wow, we are all so different. I, it's fascinating. Um, uh, so I'm Amy Hall. I'm the Vice President of Social Consciousness at Eileen Fisher. We're a women's clothing company, for anybody who's not so aware of us. And um, I've been with the company for 25 years, although I did not start as an intern. Sadly, I, it was my second career already at that point. And um, uh, so this work has started with me and under me and around me um, um, all these years. And I guess um, just a quick headline for the, some of the things that are important to us. So we're obviously a member of the apparel industry, which is a tremendous polluter, a tremendous um, user of human resources on the planet um, and natural resources. And this has become increasingly apparent to us as a business um, for the past two decades or so, and, um, and by extension to the industry. And so we have really taken it upon ourselves to figure out a way to, um, at this point, the best we can do right now is to minimize our impact, but I would say in the long term, we're looking at what are ways that we could restore the impact that we've had. Um, uh, you know, we talk about circular design, we talk about um, waste, we talk about um, labor and um, well-being of workers in the factories, et cetera. It really runs a gamut. It's through our supply chain, it's through our own businesses, our retail stores, and our partners. And we see ourselves as um, uh, models, I suppose, of, of a, perhaps a better way to do business and trying to demonstrate to the rest of the industry that there is something that we can do about this so we can stay in business, we can be a healthy business, and um, do the best that we possibly can for future generations. Let me ask you now, Dennis, um, how is sustainability going to drive changes in strategy for your sector, and how will that drive what employers are looking for employee in employees over the next five years? Are there different you know, skills and different, you know, so as the strategy changes, what's going to be different and what they are looking for? Um, I think in our industry, at least, I mean, we are, uh, you know, we're selling a product to, we hope, as many people as we possibly can get to subscribe to HBO or one of our you know, direct-to-consumer platforms. And so essentially we are uh, answering to consumers and what consumers want. Uh, what, we have, what we have seen, and I think uh, I'm gonna pat HBO on the back just because I'm on direct deposit with them every two weeks, so I have to. Um, no, I think we, you know, as was said before, we attempted years ago to be the leader uh, in these conversations around inclusion and making sure that our content reflected 
accurately the demographics of the country uh, and the constituency that we, were, that we were trying to reach out to. And so we told all stories. We invited everyone to the table. And I think that has been, in large part, the strength uh, that, you know, what you can attribute the strength of our brand and our success to. And so um, now I can sort of remember, because again, I've been there for a long time, I can remember a decade and a half ago when we were sort of pounding on everyone's door saying, you know, the browning of America is coming, the browning of America is coming, uh, meaning that more and more we were going to be talking to diverse consumers, as you said. Like, you know, it is the case now that someone in your circle, if you are not a person of color, if you're not someone part of a marginalized, historically marginalized group, you know someone who is, or you sleep next to someone who is, or your kid is someone who is. And so the kinds of issues that we've been talking about on our network, I think, for the last four plus decades are the kinds of things that everyone is talking about now. I think um, people know our brand, HBO, because we've been having those conversations with our consumers for a long time. Uh, I think that trend will continue. Um, I think it won't be a trend anymore. I think it will just be the way that people operate and do business. If you look at the content that's being offered to uh, the vast majority of audiences, it reflects a world that's vastly, vastly different than the way people perceive the world just five, ten years ago. Uh, I think that change is, is uh, what has been inevitable, uh, and I think it's unstoppable. And, and just to quick follow up on that, so are the people who are producing that content different, or are they, do they have different skills, different viewpoints, and so where is that going to lead in terms of the, the employee difference? Yeah, right? I, um, again, like hopefully cone of silence, although I don't think these people actually even work at our company anymore, but years ago I had, a conver had so many conversations about this over the years, but I can remember saying to someone in our LA office around... Um, the absence of diversity in a particular programming group. I said, listen, here's the way this works. If someone came in into this office and they said, here is a script for an incredibly, uh, what will be an incredibly successful series. We deal in five-year series at HBO. So for the next five years, you can count on this being a hit. Here's the catch. It is about a uh, multi-generational Latino household. And by multi-generational, I mean that there's a kid, a parent, and a grandparent, and the grandparent lives upstairs. And abuela, as the kid refers to her, only speaks Spanish. Do you have someone on this team who can read that script? And if the answer is no, then you're probably not right for this job anymore, right? If you don't have people sitting across the table who can understand diverse audiences, then you're probably not positioning yourself for a sustainable future in terms of content creation. Thank you. Lee, could you speak to the financial sector, both in terms of financial services and data, but also investing, and um, where you see the, that sector going in terms of ESG investing, and um, what kind of impacts that's going to have in terms of who, what kind of skills and what um, uh, the financial sector is going to be looking for, Bloomberg is looking for, in terms of its employees? Yes, yeah, certainly. The there's a huge momentum in this space around investing with environmentally <clears throat> social lenses. So whether it's called ESG or sustainable finance or social investing or impact investing, there, there's lots of catchphrases that are essentially being used to articulate the same thing, that how am I going to put sustainability into my investment process? And what's been really interesting is o over the last few years, the amount of capital being targeted towards that. So a lot of that comes from the asset owners, whether that be people I'm looking at in the room who are telling their parents or their first investment account that they want assets invested this way, um, or the asset owners themselves, the pensions, the endowments. There's now 9.6 reportedly trillion dollars in the US alone that is report that um, has a social investing mandate. So what does that mean? Investment managers are hungry for that money. So they're starting to think about product, how can they incorporate these decisions to satisfy those needs, and that's created this huge groundswell. And one of the things that has come out of that that's been really interesting because of all of the data that, I mean, I think I read 96% of all the data in the world was created in the last two years. I mean, it, there's so much is just coming into um, being right now. All of that data is being used to make financial decisions. And, and what's interesting, what's changed, is investors are starting to look at something they're calling a non-financial metric. So whereas the investment industry traditionally used to think about 
price and earnings and risk and volatility. They're now thinking about climate as that relates to risk. Where are the factories that my company or my, where, where are my clothes being made? Where are, uh, which factories are in cyclone heavy environments? Because that's a climate risk that I need to be aware of, but it's not a financial risk. And that has really flipped in the last couple of years that people are really starting to pay a huge amount of attention. So we're doing a lot of work around climate finance, um, mapping tools so that you can bring all of that data in and people can make informed you know, decisions around it. The other place you see it, um, if I monopolize the topic for a little moment, but Dennis has mentioned it on a couple of occasions and it's really being articulated or, or, or being spoke about in the financial service industry is diversification. And, and obviously there's gender diversity, but it's diversity of thought that comes from race and location of people. People of Indian descent can have one view if they were born and raised in New York and a completely different view if they live in Mumbai or maybe they live in Mumbai and now live in Australia. So it's, it's all about that diversity of thought, understanding non, uh, your unconscious bias and, and how those things are impacting the investment decisions. And, and one of the ways Bloomberg's particularly excited to have had a real impact in that space is we, from a gender perspective, we... Um, released around four years ago a gender um, uh, inclusion index and, oh sorry, a gender identity index and, and that has now um, expanded to 240 companies that are reporting information around this. We built a scoring mechanism and uh, uh, an index that people can now look at on the terminal and see how companies are doing in um, that particular space. And I realize I misspoke, it's the gender equality index. Sorry about that. But it's, it's been fascinating in how companies have reacted and wanted to um, push their data towards us and speak about you know, getting included in things like this. So it's, it's really exciting how companies are, are putting a good foot forward and you know, more data is just a powerful thing. And uh, not inconsequentially, uh, we should note that the Gender Equity Index found that the top 25% um, performers on that index also outperformed financially, right? So yes, yeah. a nice little correlation there. Um, Amy, if you could share with us, for you know, you mentioned a bit some of the challenges for the apparel sector. Where do you see things going from an environmental and social perspective moving forward in terms of the trends in the industry, and then also what that means for the kinds of people that the industry will be hiring moving forward? Wow, you know, I just had I just spent the afternoon with some colleagues in some other um, well-known <laughs> businesses. Um, we get together uh, quarterly now just to, to share um, ideas, challenges, best practices. And what I love to see happening, which is true, at least of this small group and um, many others that I see out there, is, you know, when I was first heading down this path, the social and environmental work and a lot of the cultural work is also was very siloed in the company. We, we kind of lived in a different part of the, of the building. Um, you know, our work was very contained and um, we were constantly knocking on doors and trying to get people to listen to us. And now it's all about all hands on deck inside the company. No matter where you are in the, in the company, what function, what department, you have a role related to any of this, whether it's environmental, sustainability, human rights, diversity, inclusion, um, you name it. It is um, rolled up inside your job whether you're in marketing, finance, um, facilities, et cetera. So, um, so that's one thing. That's just from the business perspective. And I would say that's probably true across many industries, not just the apparel industry. But, um, it, and also, it used to be that you know, um, in the early days, the apparel industry, people would just take, pick off the kind of lowest hanging fruit, maybe packaging, or maybe transportation, or maybe one narrow product line and they would market it as like their their eco line and now people realize gosh we are really in danger here and we're contributing to the danger on this planet we need to go really really fast and pick it up so um, you know it's really looking across all the product lines across all the processes and say where can we have the biggest where is our biggest impact where can we make the biggest impact by fixing something and now what's the future and the future is looking at circular at reuse at 
reducing or eliminating waste, at um, finding ways to make new stuff out of the old stuff, so keeping stuff out of landfill as long as possible, and um, truly minimizing our impact in every possible way. Thank you. So uh, I want to, we have a couple of minutes to have students ask questions, and then we're going to move on to the main event. So let me see if anybody has any questions here. Yes, please. And I've seen the incredible amount of waste that goes around. And sometimes I've been thinking to myself, is there any way to actually like not waste all of these water bottles? Because water bottles for me was the main thing. It's so much waste because people don't even finish the water after a little while. And then you have to change location. So then you leave it behind or you throw it away. What are certain like strategies or certain things that you as a company are implementing that can solve these issues, especially in such situations in which it's really hard to keep track of everything and in addition of the waste? That's a great question. Um, you know, there's some battles that you fight that you know you're going to win and others that you know you're going to get your butt kicked, right? Um, and in, in, our, in our industry and in our space, a lot of it, it's very hierarchical, right? So I think the very first strategy for us is to try to get to the showrunner, to the people in power, um, and say, it's up to you to create an environment where the expectation is that people will waste as little as they possibly can, right? Um, and if a showrunner who's the boss says that, uh, then nine times out of 10, you can get the next person who has the loudest, most powerful voice on the set, Reese Witherspoon or Nicole Kidman, or like, go, to the, go to the talent and impress upon them. I think that's, that has been one of the most successful strategies that we've employed is you know everyone on the set wants to be the star so if the if the star sets the example uh if the star is the person that is sort of the inspiration leader then it's easier to get other people to kind of follow suit but you're absolutely right i mean we've tried any number of things from uh giving people these sort of swell bottles as part of a uh, a welcome to uh, the production right in hopes that they hold on to those things that they're more likely to reuse uh, those water bottles rather than going back and forth for these like, you know, the open the plastic, I've seen it myself, like open the bottle, take a sip, set it down, go do your scene and never ever see it again. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it's, it's all, it's throughout the entire production. So if you're not going to win the water bottle fight, then make sure you start asking questions about what's going to happen with the set when they break it down. Is that set going to go to, um, material for the arts in Queens, which will then recycle those materials to give to New York City school uh, art teachers to make sure that, again, those products are being used again and again. Uh, are, is the furniture that comes from the set of girls going to go to uh, a family shelter in East New York uh, so that you start allocating where those things are going to go rather than just sitting in a warehouse collecting dust and never getting used again? So I say there's so many battles to fight pick some small ones and look for some small wins, which will eventually lead you to some bigger ones. Thank you. We've got a question. Okay. I don't have a question. Oh, I thought you did. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? Oh, I know some of you have questions. Yeah. All right, thank you guys so much for a great panel. Um, I was curious just a little bit about uh, how some of these changes are coming about um, within your different organizations. On the investor side, we see a lot of call for action around this with impact investing, more ESG investing. Um, but then that carries down throughout organizations. You know, um, Investors are looking for it in the companies that they're investing in, making calls for it. Companies maybe do know how to act on it or maybe don't. Um, and then you also have the consultants who are starting to see you know, more of an opportunity here, how to bring it all together. I'm just kind of curious about that, that chain of action and whether, and just to hear your comments on how all of that really is starting to come together, if you see it flushing out from the, the money coming into the companies and the demands from investors. I, I'll start with that. I think the way I would try and sum that up is it begins with identifying where risks are. So whether you're an investor looking at risks and externalities and trying to understand them, or whether you're um, uh, somebody considering HBO and, and waste on set and how that may impact the bottom line, not necessarily from the green thing, but you're spending too much on water bottles. And, and so you know, it's trying to quantify that risk and, and find the 
the, tip, the tipping point or the pressure point within an organization. And, and in a way, to um, obviously borrow from the provost earlier, I don't want to put the weight of this on all of your shoulders, but you're all about to start careers. Right? There's, there's no bigger point of leverage with your activism at this point because you're out there interviewing companies. It's, it's a mistake if you go into an interview thinking you are being interviewed. One, you're just graduating from NYU. Um, but you are interviewing, so, so you've got that power. You can start these conversations. You can start bringing your ideas very early in the process. You can identify companies where you think, in my first 18 months, I can have an impact on this one area. And, and I think those are, um, I know I'm, I'm not answering directly, but, but the, the point I guess I'm trying to make is it comes at all different levels within the organization. It can be a billion dollar hedge fund saying they're going to be activists and either get out of fossil fuels or away from guns and ammunitions, or it can be a, a, a smart um, chap at our firm who decided that if we made slightly thinner keyboards, the, the weight difference and the packing difference the material impact that would have on our greenhouse gas emissions because we have 330,000 clients that we have to ship keyboards to all over the world. I mean, right there was a measurable change. So it can happen in all different areas, but I think framing it as risk is, is a really intelligent way to go. People pay attention to risks. Thank you. Uh, can I just, so I wanna, I, sorry, two, 30 seconds, I promise. I just want to add one thing because I think what you said about diversity of thought, right, even when you think that perspective is, is, is opposed or you know, opposite of, of what your own thought is. I was in uh, Dallas, Texas last month because as you may or may not know, HBO is now owned by uh, AT&T. So now I work for the boys in Texas, um, which is new for the boy from Brooklyn. Um, <laughs> but one of the interesting things that in the conversation we're having about sustainability was someone, one of the shareholders asking, uh, because AT&T is all about building infrastructure, right? You need you need those towers so that your cell signals can be admitted so you can get 4G or 5G or what have you. But having an investor ask the question, uh, how much money were, was AT&T spending repairing damage from hurricanes? And then comparing that data from 15 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, and seeing that AT&T as a company was spending millions, hundreds of millions of dollars repairing damage from hurricanes at an increasing level. So now, whether that person believes in climate change or global warming becomes completely irrelevant to the conversation. The data doesn't lie. There are more hurricanes. So if we can find a way to mitigate or minimize uh, the number of hurricanes or the kinds of natural disasters that we're having, then the company will save money. And so the conversation becomes very different, even if everyone in the room doesn't actually vote for the same person. Thank you. So two quick builds, and then I'm going to turn it over to Randy here. So um, first and foremost, uh, one of the things I want to say, building on what Lee said about you're interviewing them, is that when I talk to CEOs about the stances that they take on issues like climate change or gun control or gay rights, they're not taking them for their customers. They're taking them for their employees in many cases because their employees are demanding that the company stand up and be aligned with the values that they have. So you do have power even as one person right, coming into a company. And to think about that in terms of what you want to do in your job and what your expectations are for your employer, I, I just wanted to support that. And then um, the other thing I wanted to say, just a, a quick advertisement for the Center for Sustainable Business, is we're doing a lot of work around the return on sustainability investment and designing frameworks for companies to actually track that, because actually they're not. right. So Verizon, probably before that question, had never actually looked at that through the lens of climate change having an impact on their expenditures. Um, so we're doing a lot of work working with business to help them actually begin to track these things. And this is, you know, just goes to another thing. We need accountants who pay attention and understand this new form of accounting to look at it just as one example. So there's going to be so many different types of jobs created in this space as we deal with all these new challenges and opportunities. So with that, I want to, um, if we can all give a great round of applause for our panelists here. And... Um, I want to thank as well, and Randy's going to introduce some of the, the other speakers who've come to be here with you tonight. I want to thank Eliza Heeks, who um, has, is from the Center for Sustainable Business and has done all the hard work to, uh, to organize tonight. Um, and I then also want to introduce um, Randy Kronthal Saka, whose brainchild it was for us to do this event here, and she's going to introduce all the other speakers. So thank you very much, everybody, and thank you, Randy.